Hello boys and girls, guys and dolls, friends old and new. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Theon and today we're going to work on this Omega Speedmaster Reduced Michael Schumacher Racing Edition. Oh, got tired just by saying that. And that's even before we do a double whammy episode, which this one is, because of what's inside the watch. In a lot of ways, this is one of the coolest uh, Speedmaster Reduced. It's got this uh, racing uh, theme uh, inspired dial and hands comes in a box that is uh, shaped like a Formula One tire. But how come the pushers and the crown are not aligned? Hmm. Well, let's check the time graph first. Looks uh, perfectly fine. It's just uh, need of a service. So we pop the back off. And we'll see the Omega 1141 movement. So what is uh, Omega 1141? Well, if we look from the side, we see that it's actually a lot of uh, different things happening here. It's actually a module chronograph on top of, a, let's say, standard uh, movement. And actually neither the movement nor the chronograph module are from Omega. So it's kind of interesting that they call it Omega 1141 when it's actually Etta and uh, Dubois de Pra. And that's how it is. With the dial and hands off, we can see that this very much looks like a very common movement. Get that 2892. Actually, this is the forerunner 2890. But we'll see we can easily take uh, the movement off the module. So we'll do that uh, first. So, what this actually means is that you're getting a bonus episode here. You're getting kind of two movements. And it's not even Christmas. Happy days. We see that uh, the wheel train is uh, sort of still running a little bit. So that's a typical sign that there's a lot of dirt in the movement. We're going to rather unceremoniously just pick this uh, movement apart. I'm sure there are tons of videos out there of uh, the 2890 or the 2892 anyway. The main difference is this little part here. This one is actually the driver for the chronograph seconds. Very important. We'll get back to that later. And this is not a new movement, even though uh, it's still very popular. It was actually first introduced around the mid-70s. It is a nice little movement. A few strange uh, solutions, but uh, overall very solid uh, movement. Solid in terms of performance, that is. The uh, wheel train cock is not exactly solid. So you may uh, ask yourself, uh, why would Omega use an ETA movement with a module from a different uh, manufacturer on top of it? Good question. Let me know if you have more. I honestly don't know why they did that. But when it first came out, it was marketed as uh, the Speedmaster Reduced. And the main difference between uh, this version with the module and the uh, automatics uh, with the uh, 7750 versions is that the registers are on the same spot in this one as uh, on the professional. So that is likely the reason why they went for this module instead of a full uh, movement. So that they could uh, basically just reduce the size have the same dial layout as uh, on the professional, the moon watch. So when the reduced was introduced in uh, 1988, it looked pretty much exactly the same as the uh, professional, with the black dial and everything. 
is smaller. So reduced. Eureka! I think we found the answer. Well, with that, we're over to uh, the main event. The module. Now, if you ever get the chance to service this module, run! Run like the wind! Don't look back! And you can see why here it's like more floating parts than the Titanic. Just layer upon layer of highly polished, slippery things that sort of slide away from each other. So if you have a speed mass reduced and you take it for service, Omega typically just changes the module. And of course they charge you as the customer. That said, uh, the module is, of course, uh, serviceable, and it's actually not that bad. But um, until you've done it a couple of times, it can be tricky, and it's absolutely best to follow the manual. I have a link to the manual in the description, so uh, for those so inclined, go ahead. As you can see, we're also pretty unceremoniously uh, just taking this apart. Going to spend a little bit more time on the logic behind it when we put it together. And there are a couple of snags with this specific movement. First is that this screw actually broke off. So we have to use the screw extractor to get uh, the other piece out. And you might have seen that uh, the little friction spring on top of the minute counter wheel looked a bit homemade. But it does seem to work, so we're going to leave it at that. One thing to note though is that uh, the Dubois de Pra module is actually quite popular. So you will find it in a lot of watches. So I believe uh, Breitling has used it, Tag Heuer has used it, Bowman Mercier. It is a very versatile module that fits on top of a lot of movements. Now to get the broken screw out, we're going to use this uh, screw extractor. So we place the plate with the screw stuck inside it between these two uh, runners. And then tighten them up. And then we basically unscrew the entire plate. And that way the screw comes out. All right, time to fill the basket. It's going to be fuller than most of the time. All right, with all the hardware back from the cleaners, we can uh, first uh, start assembling the base movement. Nothing too fancy here, so we're going to go pretty quickly through this as well. And I just wanted to also say that uh, a lot of this was actually shot a little while ago, while I was still working on my... Uh, old uh, white man honky afro. I'm still waiting for uh, a camera that I'm pretty excited about. And with that I uh, think the production quality can be better as well. But I think there's also an improvement in the later part of this video, so uh, those who uh, stick with me will see. Now, one fun fact. 
seventy percent of uh, people watching this uh, are not subscribers. So if you haven't yet subscribed and you think this is uh, worth a few minutes of your time, then uh, please uh, smash that uh, subscriber button. Can't believe I just said smash the button. Oh well, that's how it is when you have uh, kids. They're not proud of you for uh, putting food on the table. They're not proud of you for having a good, good job. But yeah, publish a video on YouTube and all of a sudden they're proud of you. Freaking kids, man. When I was a boy in Norway, we had to walk with the snow up to our chests just to go watch one TV channel in black and white. And it only started broadcasting at six o'clock in the evening. YouTube. Kind of wish I had a Casio right now. Anyway, we're uh, putting together the Barrow Bridge. This uh, movement has uh, the winding works on the underside of the bridge. Neat little arrangement there. And what is pretty uncommon with this uh, version, and also uh, the family, if you will, is that you have to put uh, the barrel bridge on before you can put the train bridge on. Otherwise, you're going to press on uh, the third wheel. Now, this is the train wheel cock. I'm saying cock because it only has one screw. And that is a weak point with this movement. The weakness being that uh, when you press the second hand on, if you don't have support under that uh, cock, the whole cock is going to give way and you're going to have a very rapid rundown of the mainspring in the movement. So watch out for that. The keyless works is in, uh, let's say, the common uh, ETA way of doing it with the 28 series. It works well. But it lacks, uh, let's say, the solidity and, in my view, the elegance of uh, previous calibers. But that's how it is, you know, when you get older. There's definitely a very tight correlation between grumpiness and age. I feel I'm getting grumpier every day. I'm going to start buying uh, Casios by the truckload uh, just to get through in a couple of years. Oh no, what did he do? Did he put the cannon pinion wheel upside down? Yeah, it's actually a good way to uh, oil it. As you need a little bit of oil there, just uh, so the friction spring uh, can slip as it should. So we're almost done with the base movement. Just need to get the pallet fork and the balance in place. Now we did use uh, Epilum or Fixer Drop on the pallet fork and the escape wheel. I'm not going to show that because this video is going to be too long as it is. And we also did put uh, grease on the pallet fork uh, exit stone. So let's get the balance back on and then we can see if the base movement runs a little bit better now. Yes, it does. And yeah, this is how an Omega movement should run. 
and also an ETA movement, I suppose. We also put the uh, automatic uh, bridge back in place. And yes, I promise there will be less hair shortly. This is uh, Etta's entry into the tiniest screw contest. Always gotta love using the white screwdriver. Alrighty. With the base movement running safe and sound, let's turn to the module. <laughs> so this module has uh, more jewels than your average Psycho Automatic. And uh, there is a reason for it, even those four jewels underneath that uh, first driving wheel. Because there's very little power, of course, to the chronograph. All the power to the chronograph train comes from that little uh, pinion that was uh, press fit onto the fourth wheel pivot. Now, given that the module lies on top of the dial side of the base movement, you also need to replicate uh, the hour and minute hands. And that is done by a separate train, actually. So this wheel here picks up the energy from uh, the minute wheel in the base movement and directly drives the uh, hour and minute hand on the module. So uh, we put on the chronograph bridge the chronograph uh, seconds wheel uh, can be a little bit tricky to get uh, in place. Best thing is to put it into the bridge and then uh, put the whole assembly in. And the hammer on the underside of the bridge. Uh, best thing is also to leave that one in place. It is actually very easy to adjust if, uh, if you do take it off, but it's not uh, normally necessary. What we're putting in here now is the second hand uh, train. Driven directly from this uh, second hand uh, driving wheel. That connects with that little press fit pinion we discussed. Hmm, I think I need a manicure also. Now the manual uh, calls for a 90-20 oil on all the different pivots. If you don't have 90-20, the 90-10 should be fine. 90-20 is typically used on a little bit bigger watches. This is the friction clutch. And the wheel that this uh, clutch is uh, friction uh, pressing on is indirectly driven by this uh, second uh, train uh, driving wheel that we first put in. So we're actually assembling this uh, module now in the start position. So what happens when uh, you press the pause button is that uh, the friction clutch presses the wheel so it stops moving. So 
somewhat different from typical uh, friction clutch uh, chronographs. We use HP 1300 or D5 on this light pressure points. And where there's even higher pressure, we use a molecule TX. Should be fine to use 9501 and 9504 as well, but uh, not WD 40 or fish oil or sunflower oil, also not uh, recommended. Now, some of these uh, wheels can be a little bit tricky to uh, oil properly. So using a staking block can be a good uh, trick. Or you can hold them between the tweezers like this. And then we we'll put some HP1300 or D5 on this uh, hard shaped cams. Now putting all these uh, things together, uh, I think if you're a skilled uh, Jenga player, you would do very well in this uh, kind of uh, module. Everything is highly polished because there's so little force, so you need to have a little friction. That also makes it more slippery, of course. And some of these parts uh, do like to ping. Now this last wheel that we're putting in now is actually probably the most crucial one because it connects the chronograph train with the second uh, train driving wheel. Now this little operating clutch lever that runs in that little slot there can be a bit uh, tricky to get in place. So it might be better to get that one in place first even when you put on the main plate or the top plate. But it's nothing a little black magic cannot fix. All right, time to make a layer cake. As uh, you might imagine, the distance between uh, the wheels in the chronograph module and this uh, little pinion in, uh, in the base movement is crucial. So that's why uh, the base movement and the module is connected uh, with these uh, small pillars. So now we can put uh, the dial back on. Don't worry, we did screw it down. I'm also not going to show uh, pressing all the different hands on. Just have to trust me that the hands are pressed on. One particular thing with this dial is that it's extremely unforgiving in terms of uh, misplacing or misaligning the chronograph seconds hand. So it might be better to actually start with uh, that one. Well, not the actual chronograph seconds hand, but uh, the central hands. And make sure you line those up well before you put uh, the other register hands on. But I'm not one to listen to good advice, so uh, here we go. But it is a very cool dial, I must say. 
really stands out. So we're trying to place the chronograph seconds hand. When we think we have it in the right place, we're going to let it run for a while. And then see where we are. And this looks just about acceptable. For the case, uh, it's actually in very good condition, so uh, it only needs some cleaning. So we're going to take the pushers out and clean the case. The bezel is actually not necessary to take off, but uh, we're going to do it anyway to clean it. And uh, the crystal is quite scratched, so we're going to fix that as well. Let's get the case into the ultrasonic, and then we can work on the bezel. Manicure. I mean, you can say what you want, but manicure beats pedicure, right? At least if you consider my feet. How many of you uh, look down at your own feet right now? All right, we're cleaning the bezel. What's important, of course, with the bezel is that it has a tachymeter scale, so we need to align that with the dial. And meanwhile, we also got the case back from the cleaners. Looks nice and shiny. For the crystal then, that is the original crystal, so we're going to keep that. What we need to do though is to get those uh, deep scratches out, and we cannot use uh, Polo Watch for that. We need to rub it out with the sandpaper. Now, under the sandpaper I have a little bit softer uh, layer, so that you can uh, get uh, to the round edges of the crystal. I started with 800 grit, then went to 1200 and 2000. And after 2000, uh, the scratches are so fine that you can use Polo Watch to uh, make it uh, nice and shiny. All right. These crystals are pretty tight, so we do have to use uh, press for it. But luckily we have one. With the crystal in place, we're going to also clean the inside of the crystal. It's not great to have the dirt on the inside when you get a watch like this. I'm happy not to see more gray hair. And I'm not talking about in the mirror because uh, apparently they are there. But at least uh, not in the video. So uh, going forward, there will be less of that. And in a week or two, I hope to have my uh, latest camera. So I hope you get some good pictures from that as well. Last thing we did was to put some uh, Lubetta 106 on the ball bearings. And then we can place the case back. And the leather strap, we're going to keep the original leather strap on, even though it has seen better days. And there we go.
Omega Speedmaster Reduced Schumacher Racing Edition. Now that's a mouthful, but it is a beautiful watch. Looks very cool on the wrist, I must say. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then uh, clicking like and subscribe will really help the channel. We'll be back shortly, and until then, ta-ta. <laughs>